What's up, everyone? This is Mike Kaju, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I am actually the one getting interviewed. My girlfriend, Adi Zucker, the owner of Working Against Gravity, interviews me. Uh, she t- we talk about uh, my family life, uh, overcoming addiction, getting into CrossFit, competing, winning the games, starting Brute, all of that kind of stuff. So if you want to get to hear my story a little bit, check it out. Also, if you have time, please leave us a review by going to iTunes, Brute Strength Podcast. Uh, Give me some feedback. Hope you enjoy the show. So this is a little bit of a different show today. My name is Adi Zucker, and I am Michael Cashew's girlfriend. And I also own a nutrition coaching company called Working Against Gravity. I'm also a weightlifter. And I decided that I'm going to put Michael in the hot seat and interview him on his own podcast for the first time. (laughs) We're both a little bit nervous. Definitely. I mean, it's my first time interviewing anybody, so uh, I'm a little nervous. And it's your first time being interviewed on your own podcast Mm -hmm. and by me. Yeah. So uh, this should be interesting. I will start with... uh, Michael is a really interesting guy. He's got a really good story. So I think we should roll in and out of your story and fitness and business. And uh, my goal today is to inspire as many people as possible. So how about we start with you're from a city called New Roads in Louisiana. And how many people live in New Roads? 5,000. And it's really interesting this is kind of a tangent, but it's uh, 2,500, basically 2,500 white people, 2,500 black people, and it's almost completely split by a set of train tracks. So it's uh, it's still a very like segregated community. It's still like that? Mm-hmm. That's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. So in New Roads, your family still lives there? Yep. Your whole Big family? family. Probably 50 to 100 people. Extended family. And they all live in New Roads still. (laughs) And tell us a little bit about your family and what they're like and your relationship with them. My extended family in general is super, super close. We get, we do all holidays together. We do Sundays together as like big groups and stuff like that. My immediate family is just as close and they are also very, very open-minded Um, both of my parents are very smart, very driven people, uh, goal oriented and they, you know, they instilled most, if not all of what I would consider my best qualities. You know, they've, they've taught me how to be a good person, how to be, they've, they've taught me through the way they live, how to be humble, um, how to work hard, all of those kinds of things. So, super close family. Uh, I don't know how, you know, any other way. Right. So you have this amazing family that taught you all these amazing things. For those of you that don't know, Michael found himself addicted to drugs and... I just woke up one day and I found myself (laughs) addicted. (laughs) Well, how do you... So most people would say that you meet somebody who's been an addict, who's been through rehab, they can generally attribute it to some traumatic experience they've had or a family relationship or something like that. What do you attribute uh, getting yourself into that situation? I think it started out as a combination of just trying to be cool. I was really young. I was, you know, nine years old when I when I took my first couple shots of whiskey, uh, it was my ninth birthday and that was just to be cool to some older kids that were at the birthday party. And, you know, somewhere around then, I just, I I thought the bad kids were the cool kids and I always wanted to be the cool kid. And so I would go to literally any lengths to be the cool kid. Um, And, you know, that just meant doing worse and worse drugs where where I came from. Right, those were the bad kids. There were some kids that were shooting drugs in their arms, and you know, eventually that's where that's where it led me. Mixed with a little bit of boredom, um, I didn't find I didn't find junior high, high school very challenging at all. Um, 
So I think that probably has a little bit to do with it. And from there, it turned into like a physical addiction. Uh, I also have definitely have a an addictive personality. So once I, you know, once I started using these really powerful painkillers and benzo benzodiazepines and stuff like that, there anybody anybody can get addicted to those. Couple that with my addictive personality, it became a physical addiction and it was a daily thing all day long uh, for a few years there. What do you think was your like rock bottom moment that changed it all? Mm, my rock bottom moment did not come until after I had gone to rehab for about a year and a half. And where did you go to rehab? In Utah. So I spent a year and a half in different uh, inpatient treatment centers as well as a transition house. And after about a year and a half, uh, I, I had gotten, I had gained a lot of awareness about myself and about depression and anxiety and stuff like that, but I didn't have any purpose in life whatsoever. Um, I didn't have any friends in Salt Lake City when I got out of rehab. Uh, a lot of the kids that I was hanging around were, I mean, they just weren't, they weren't very driven, weren't very like into the things that I was into, right? They were smoking cigarettes and a lot of them were drinking and using when they weren't, weren't supposed to be. And I wanted to play sports and study and make friends and all of that kind of stuff. So I got really, really lonely because uh, I have no drugs to escape with anymore and I have no friends in this brand new city where I don't really know anyone. So I isolated myself over the course of a, a couple months and I relapsed really, really hard. Uh, within the first day, I was um, smoking crack and smoking heroin, which is, I don't think I, yeah, I never smoked heroin before in my life. And the first day that I relapsed, I smoked heroin. Wow. Right? It was and and that's very common in the recovery community like it comes back with a vengeance, right? And so it definitely did for me. I spent thousands of dollars over the course of this this week. It was a is a one week span where I was using. Um got myself into a lot of dangerous situations and, you know, uh like apartments and parts of town that I would never dare go and I really the the worst for me was when I finally a friend of mine actually wrote an article I think it might be up today uh, a friend of mine a couple friends of mine called me out and basically turned me into the treatment center and uh, as well as my parents and I was still it, it hadn't been long enough to where I, I was like bad off enough to where I didn't want to quit. So it was early on enough where I, I was able to quit after a week. <clears throat> so the the rock bottom for me was realizing I just went through a year and a half of treatment and you know my my family spent hundreds of hours probably sobbing and crying and then they saw me recover and get better and they see the light in my eyes again and stuff like that and then I go and do this. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was very, a very emotional time. Um, I think they were probably more scared than ever because I had just gone through some really, really good treatment facilities and I still can't stay clean. Right. And I felt in that moment, I felt very strong and I felt like rejuvenated, but they didn't know that. And I could feel that from them. I could feel their fear and their disappointment or really just, just, just fear and um, sadness, really. And that was, that was it for me. I, I haven't used those drugs since then. And since then, so your commitment after that, you're rejuvenated, you're motivated. What has kept you from that happening again? Was it going to AA meetings or what was your practice to keep you? Right after that, it was a combination of at least one hour a day of an AA meeting. So I would, a lot of times I would go to two, I, as well as spending time working with other alcoholics, whether it be informally or formally via sponsorship. Uh, couple that with 
all of the things I learned in therapy, which are, you know, different communication skills, simple things like being honest, um, meditation, um, trying to be present, right? All of those kinds of things. Do you still need to do those kinds of things today? Absolutely. And honestly, I, I, I kind of go, I've gone in waves over the past, what, I'm 25, over the past seven years. You're almost right? 26. Almost 26. So almost eight years, right? I've gone in waves of really prioritizing, taking care of myself, right? Uh, like emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and, and then not, right? And I'll, I'll focus on something else for a little while. Right now, I'm probably focusing on this kind of stuff more than ever. And when I say this kind of stuff, like working on personal growth, it is... Yeah, it's absolutely what keeps me happy and free every day. And that's what did it for me then. It was just a different version. I feel like I've definitely evolved since then. And I have, you know, far more clarity and, and tranquility and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's still a huge part of my life today. So you went to rehab, relapsed, recovered again. You've been basically recovered ever since and after you leave rehab was it when exactly did you find crossfit and fitness like do you remember the exact moment where was it like something else and then it led you to crossfit how did that relationship start i'll never forget it okay i had just run the salt lake city marathon and and you did did you do that while you were in rehab like because you have you know, to train for a marathon or you just went I got cold out of rehab i started training Right, and I was fucking gung ho about it. I ran every single day for the marathon. Yeah, I did really well, and then I was completely burnt out on running. And I grew up playing sports. Like I, I was, I used to hate running, but that's all I knew how to do, or that's all I felt comfortable doing. Right, going right out of rehab. So right. I did that. I, I think right, like probably a month after that, I'm just like going to. Gold's Gym or, or 24 Hour Fitness, not having a clue what I'm doing. And super bored, doing it all alone. And then I met this guy, Bryce Astle. Were you just at the Gold's Gym just making up your own workouts or like things you found online or? Oh, uh, just what, like what I used to do for training for football, right? Okay. Bench press, back squat, front squat, some deadlifts, some power cleans, you know, functional movements for sure, but it was so, so boring. Um, yeah, it was really boring for me. And so you meet Bryce at the gym? No, I met Bryce through my chemical dependency counselor. He was in AA and he was a young guy and there and, and my chemical dependency counselor was trying to hook me up with some young people to like go do outdoor activities because she knew how much I wanted to get into that, uh, how much I needed that. And I met Bryce and we became, we became friends instantly and then as you know we became best friends over time but he he said hey man uh why don't you come try out this thing crossfit that i do and i had literally never heard of it and it was crossfit nrg and we did the workout fight gone bad and i was hooked it was amazing i had never felt anything like it and i also was really bad at it <laughs> it was humbling and i wanted to I really, really wanted to not be bad at it. So that was kind of a driving factor. But probably a month later is when I relapsed. So I took some time off. So I did it for a month, something like that. Took some time off. And when I came back, probably in December of 2009, uh, I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. I had started smoking after that marathon, which is incredibly ironic. And uh, I kept smoking once I got sober again, because it was kind of just a vice and I gave myself the excuse, like it's better than using drugs, right? So I went into CrossFit again, smoking a pack a day and I did a couple workouts. I'm like, I literally cannot do this anymore. One of these has to go. And I was having a really fun time doing CrossFit workouts. It was a really positive community and I knew it was something really good for me. And I chose to give up cigarettes. So it kind of sounds like cigarettes was like keeping you from relapsing as like something for you to have as a vice and then that cross was one, yeah, for sure. And then CrossFit kind of replaced that. Yes. I mean, yeah, there's definitely it's definitely a mixture of 
internal personal like tasks like uh say getting over resentments making amends working and serving others right that's you have to do that part for yourself um but for me, I absolutely needed something to be fired up about, right? And, and just going to AA meetings was not enough and school definitely didn't do that for me. I needed something that gave me like a purpose, right? Something that I could strive for mastery in and CrossFit was really perfect and everybody knows it. It's, you can never master everything in CrossFit. Right. And so it was this really exciting thing that I looked forward to every single day. I started thinking about it hours a day and um if nothing else it just gave me a very positive release to stop thinking about how miserable i was i love that that's awesome crossfit for sure does that for so many people mm -hmm. and so many people have the same a similar version of that story which is why i love crossfit and the crossfit right. community so much yeah i mean you hear it all the time even if it's uh someone very successful has a desk job they're like fuck this makes me feel alive again this makes me feel young mm -hmm. it was it's 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 that way for everyone yeah and it kind of makes every other aspect of your life so much better like someone who has a desk job or feels unmotivated go to crossfit get super motivated i bet they feel like they're doing better at their job as well mm -hmm. uh, i love that um, my next question. So you find CrossFit, you love CrossFit. It gets you super fired up. I mean, I'm sure all the listeners can remember that like beginning stages of falling in love with CrossFit and just thinking about it all the time and watching videos and reading and learning. Uh, so you go on to basically reach the top of the CrossFit food chain. So you win the CrossFit games twice on a team. And what was that experience like? That was an incredible experience, for sure. One of the best of my life. And really, it uh, the process of training with those guys uh, and girls, right? The process of training for those three years that I went to the games was the, the most impactful part, right? Not just winning the games, but I, I learned how to work hard like none other, right? I, I, it really taught me how to... Uh, set my mind to something and stick to something even when the times are rough and even when I don't want to go to the gym and that kind of thing. That's a very valuable lesson that I learned. Uh, the camaraderie that I found there was incredible and it taught me how to be more of a team player and stuff like that. The experience of, of winning, uh, I mean, I'm just so, I'm so grateful that, you know, all of our hard work paid off, you know, um, it was amazing. So, and, it, and it continues to give me a lot of confidence for sure. Yeah, it's pretty cool to reach the top of anything. Or like, I mean, CrossFit's interesting because you can't really ever master it. But I mean, being at the top two years in a row is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, why did you stop doing competing in CrossFit? So what happened after the second time you won the games? Well, actually a little bit before that, it, this is 2013, right around, right before the Open was going to start. I, I've been having a lot of, well, I've always had a lot of back pain, but then I was having, I couldn't feel like below my knees when I would it's wake like up. like not morning. normal kind of back right. pain. I literally couldn't feel below my knees at all. <laughs> and yeah, my, my sciatic and my glutes constantly hurt. And so, yeah, when I started getting the numbness, I'm like, fuck, I need to go to the doctor. So I go to the doctor. I go to a surgeon in uh, Baton Rouge who was who used to work for the Saints, and he said that a condition I knew I had, which is called spondylolisthesis, had significantly worsened. And when he showed us the the X rays, I mean, it's just terrifying. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna be paralyzed, right? It looks like that. And he said, "You need to quit CrossFit right now." I, I, I think you'll be able to move, you know, for the rest of your life, but it, it, you're going to be in pain. You're not going to be able to do what you do now, right? You, you need to stop right now because you're like one bad power clean away from being paralyzed potentially. And this uh, is before or, the games. Yes, this is before the Open. And oh, so my. We, and we, everybody was already committed. No one could go individual at that point. So I'm like, fuck, if I don't go... No one goes. Right? <laughs> so obviously you go. <laughs> well, 
I, I, I saw a bunch of different surgeons um, and actually I, I had decided I'm going to see one more person at the University of Utah and if he says I can do it, I'm going to do it. If he says I, I can't, I won't. And he ended up saying that I can. And so I finished the, yeah, that was actually right before the fifth open workout. I remember that. And so I, I finished the open and then we went on to regionals, went on to the games, won the games. And then right after that, I knew I was done with CrossFit. So and as you're going through this like open regionals games, what's like one to 10, how much pain are you in? Um, a constant four to five. It was, it was almost never uh, excruciating. Only, only a couple occasions were like really really bad where I couldn't move but usually it was just a four or five but it was always there and even while you're working it didn't get worse while you worked out Mm, it actually got a little bit better while I worked out oh okay yeah that's interesting (laughs) just like blood flowing through the Mm -hmm. area and stuff like that yeah all right uh so did you when you had back surgery and you're uh you go into this you know like this is like serious surgery this isn't just like I mean, you go and work on, get a shot on your shoulder and you have like a couple weeks or a couple months and you can recover. Did you have any inclination that you could or a dream or hope that you could recover and be back to where you were at? A little bit. Yeah, definitely. And talking to, talking to some uh, phys- physician's assistants and, and some of the specialists that I talked to even were like, you could definitely get back to where you were right and you could do it safely but the risk was now that i have fused discs right where it used to be um like i just have less discs to disperse all of that load so all of my vertebrae are under more relative load now so to do what i what i used to do to train like i used to train is just not safe for the rest of my back and so it's very common for people to get one fusion done and then years later they get another fusion and that's people that are not doing crossfit and definitely not competing in crossfit you know what i mean so uh, for me there have definitely been a couple times where i'm like fuck i really want to get back into this uh, i i honestly i was in the best shape of my entire life this year Right. But the volume, if you make me do two workouts in one day, I'm going to crumble. Right. And it's just not worth it to me. It's not worth, you know, not being able to run around with my, you know, hopefully future kids, um, not being able to just stay active myself when I get older, um, just for like what, one or two more years of competing. I I feel it's easier for me that we won to be like, I have fully fulfilled, you know, like my potential in this sport. I feel like, I feel like very comfortable and content with it. So how do you now stay motivated to, is it, what's like that transition like going from being like the elite, the super competitive now transitioning, having back surgery and going into this stage of training for general physical preparedness like what is that transition like well at first so this happened in december of 2013 i think it was and i was so right after the surgery i couldn't really walk for more than 400 meters for about a month Um, over the next like three months i was very depressed after the first couple weeks i got really depressed and it was a combination of just not being able to move and I'm, I love to move around every day and stuff like that, as well as who am I? You know, like I've always been an athlete and that was like, that was one of, if not the biggest thing I, I, that I identified as, right? I'm an athlete. Uh, yeah. And so I didn't have that anymore. And so I really wrestled with it. Like, what do people think of me? What do, what am I worth? All of that kind of stuff. And I was very self-conscious about it. I would go and do these seminars for what was then Bruce Barbell. We would do these seminars and I could, I couldn't even barely walk. Right. And I couldn't demo any of the movements and stuff like that. And I used to be so good at CrossFit and now all of a sudden I can't do any of this. And it was extremely humbling. I think that that's probably common um, in 
athletics in general, but also, I mean, you were really young when you won the CrossFit Games. So I said you were 22 and 23 or 21 and 22. Yeah, one of those. And then now you're still young, still like probably in, in what should be like the peak of your physical mm-hmm. shape and you're not competing. So, and that was such a large part of your identity. That transition, I could imagine, would make anybody feel depressed or... Um, questioning their worth. So how do you um, pull yourself out of that? I mean, how did you even end up coaching seminars when you couldn't even, like, I feel like most people would would just retreat and not even participate at all. Like, what kept you motivated to be part of the community? Um, I, I had to be, I felt like I had to be involved some way. And I just, I, I quickly, I was already coaching a little bit. And I felt like I was a good coach. I was coaching at LSU at the time. And so I definitely felt like a good coach. And so that was kind of a natural thing. Like I just, I suddenly switched my focus to being the best possible coach I can be, right? And best possible business owner that I can be. And it's been, yeah, it was it was a struggle for a while. Like what am I going to do with my body physically? And it's still to this day, like I haven't found that competitive edge again. And it's something I definitely... Um, strive for and want to find but yeah coaching just became that thing for me and and I dove in to learning more about coaching even more than I ever had I think that's really important for for anybody who finds themselves in a situation where they can't do the things that they love to do like they physically can't do it like spending the exact same amount of time like you still ha- that time is there and you've created time for fitness and for CrossFit. And now a large amount of time is freed up. So to fill it with something equally, um, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable and even if you're scared, mm-hmm. to fill that time with the same thing, at least until you figure out um, where your direction is moving Absolutely. forward. You have to be, I say you, I constantly have to be doing something at least one thing in my life where I'm learning rapidly, right? Something that's really uncomfortable and that I'm constantly trying to learn, trying to catch up to, stuff like that. That's what keeps life exciting. Right. I think that's something that's really hard for a lot of people. What what advice would you give to somebody who's having a hard time uh, making that leap from that feeling of discomfort to do something different like they can't do what makes them feel comfortable and that thing that they were really good at what piece of advice would you give to somebody who to take that step over that feeling of discomfort to something maybe similar but a little bit new yeah i think a couple things one is write down all of the worst case scenarios right what if you take this leap of faith what you know maybe it's take a new job write down all of the worst case scenarios and most of the time you'll realize that even the worst case scenarios either are super unlikely or they're not that bad okay the second part i totally lost my train of thought (laughs) um advice for people to take a step over that feeling of discomfort doing something new right remind yourself or or think of it as a um it's not a permanent thing, right? Give yourself like one week on whatever activity or, or decision it is that you're gonna make. Um, and then after the week, you can reassess. And if you and if it's not going well, you can go right back to what you were doing. If it's going well, which it usually will, keep going. Right, I love that. It's not permanent. Mm-hmm. Like that's so big. Like it's nothing you do is permanent, really. Right. So you always are going to have an opportunity. It doesn't have to be this like huge commitment or it doesn't have to become part of your identity right away. It, you have time. I love that. That's really good advice for sure. Um, do you think you're going to compete again ever? I, I am pretty damn sure I'll never compete in CrossFit again. I think I'll definitely compete in something physical again, for sure. I would be disappointed if I did. (laughs) (laughs) So you'll think you'll search for some new um, activity. Do you have any ideas of what that would be? What For sure. Jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I've done jiu-jitsu before, and I love it physically. And then, as you know, like it totally vibes with everything I'm about, like the, the martial art in general, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's a form of meditation, 
um, but also allows me to use my body as much as I possibly can, as well as my mind. Right. So if anyone listening knows a jujitsu gym in San Marcos, Texas, which is a little bit south of Austin, let us know. Please. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to switch it up a little bit before we wrap up. So you are this like, it's, I think you can already tell from the things that we've talked about that you are love challenging yourself. You love making yourself a little bit uncomfortable learning. So you've now channeled all that energy that you channeled into being the best at CrossFit into being a pretty amazing business owner, leader. Uh, you've created this team of people that follow you that are just or work with you and it's pretty amazing to see I only saw it like in the past year but the growth in the past year is pretty uh, amazing when you what was like your dream job growing up honestly I didn't think much about it if I wanted to be a pro skateboarder as soon as I played Tony Hawk pro skater the blue game on Nintendo 64 <laughs> That lasted for a couple years. I actually, probably for the majority of it, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I slowly realized that that was probably not going to happen. Um, I thought I was probably going to become a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. (laughs) Super fun. Um, Did you ever imagine that your life would be the way that it is right now? I mean... For those who don't know, Michael is the CEO and owner of Brute Strength. He has multiple different programs going on. You can sign up for Brute Strength if you want to just look better, if you want to get stronger, if you want to be awesome at CrossFit. He has like some of the best in the game working with him to make these programs, these epic programs. Uh, people are seeing some amazing success. It's You're touching the lives of probably more people than you've ever imagined. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I Yeah, I didn't imagine it in my wildest dreams. I thought a businessman was a crook, right? Because I thought all they were doing was, um, they were basically, I thought they were all selling people shit and they were just good at being quote unquote salesmen. And so when I thought of a businessman as a kid, I was like, there's no way I'll ever want to do that. Um, and so we started, we started Brute when I moved back to Utah and I realized like I, I have, I can interact, I can affect way more people this way, right? Um, I can inspire more people. I have this, this bigger platform to like reach people, inspire people, stuff like that. And it also allows me to, you know, I don't like to really take orders from anyone and it allows me to, you know, have a lot of freedom and stuff like that. And we have an incredible team you know, on our staff and they make me better every single day. I think that a lot of people would probably um, love to be in the kind of position that you're in. And I know and truly believe like with 100% of uh, myself that anybody can do it. Mm-hmm. Like I really do believe that if that's, if it's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you, if it's not what you want to do, then you it won't be successful at it just trying. But I'm sure a lot of that came with that discomfort and uh, do you ever get afraid of your position? I am in constant, I have constant fear about it and I've basically just, and, and that fear looks like, oh my God, the numbers look different this month, we're going to fail or Uh, so-and-so had negative feedback, we're going to fail. Blah, 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 we're going to fail, we're going to fail. I've learned to navigate and still operate, you know, for me at a a high level while I have that fear. Um, I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think it'll always, it'll evolve, it'll change into fear about different stuff. It'll always be there. And so I've just, I've, I've gotten more comfortable with being uncomfortable, if you will. Right. It's that, kind of like CrossFit too, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like CrossFit, like being uncom- being comfortable with being yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so you are very disciplined in doing all these things that you're talking about, in being comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
do you find things that help you it's routines that help you do that exercises that you do daily like what is it that's keeping you is it just practice is it just time like what is it that somebody who's like i'm i'm afraid to do that or i'm like like that whole fear of i'm gonna fail what keeps you from giving into that oh that was a bunch of questions sorry what keeps you from giving into that what what keeps you disciplined is my question. What keeps me disciplined? Yeah, to... Um, well, so first you asked what keeps me from giving into the fear, the feeling of fear, and that is a few things. I've, I've meditated for a long time, for eight years on and off, and what, what that's done for me is it's taught me that I am not my feelings. Right, so it lets me, so a lot of people, and me, me for sure, still to this day sometimes, when I start feeling afraid or sad or whatever, Michael is sad. Like I, all I can think about is the stories in my head, et cetera, et cetera. And what meditation has done for me is let me kind of take a step outside of my head and observe those thoughts and those feelings. And so when I'm feeling this kind of stuff around work, um, if I'm practicing meditation uh, regularly, then I kind of have this uh, bird's eye view. I have this awareness of, oh, look, there's fear. That's interesting. What's the fear about, right? And I can kind of dissect it and it doesn't have to dictate how I act. Um, I have to, the, the, the more disciplined I am with like, uh, my morning routine, um, which is what morning routine, meditation, Ramwad, journaling, and then reading it takes about two hours. Um, if I'm disciplined with that, and I'm also disciplined with how I spend my time at work, so not just checking email constantly, or you know, just being in inefficient, right? If I batch my work appropriately and and make sure I'm productive like that, then the, all of those feelings are lessened. I'm more confident, I feel more relaxed, all that kind of stuff. I'm what, not sure if that's a, if that answers your no, question. No, def that definitely does. What would you recommend to somebody who's never tried uh, meditation before? What would be your recommendation to them? I have, I have two recommendations. One, definitely download the app Headspace. Uh, some people that listen to us a lot are probably sick of that. But download the app Headspace. It's free for 10 days. If you don't like it, you know, you only wasted a maximum of 100 minutes. Um, the, the other thing that I would highly recommend, if you haven't heard this already, go listen to Sam Harris, How to Meditate. And it's a 26-minute uh, YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's, it's audio only. But... He explains it really, really well. And after that 26 minutes, I would bet 90% of you are gonna be feeling phenomenal. You're gonna be feeling this new thing, uh, this awareness, right? Uh, maybe about your life, or maybe it's just kind of a calm um, space in your head. I, I love that. How about for people that have a hard time getting into that routine or being disciplined with their time, what would you recommend for those people? Um, so I had this, if you listen to the podcast I did with Chris Powell, we talked about this. So Chris is the host of the TV show uh, Extreme Weight Loss on ABC. And so he has these people that need to lose 200 pounds, uh, 300 pounds, whatever. And they come onto the show and they're incredibly motivated. They, they feel like they have this second the second chance, uh, highly motivated, and they wanna do 100 things all at once, right? And that's like all of us. We, we hit some kind of pain point or, or maybe even rock bottom, and we are super, super motivated, so we wanna do all of these changes at once. I would say do one thing and do it every single day, right? Because if you, ha if you try to do five things at once and then life gets in the way as it always does, then you're going to, uh, most people are going to slack off, they're gonna start making excuses, and before long, you're not doing any of the five. 
one thing is manageable. So do the one thing that you think will make the biggest impact on your life and do that every single day. Uh, make it a rule for yourself, no matter if you're traveling, if you're at home, whatever, one thing every single day. Love it. And also another recommendation would be to get the book called The Perfect Day Formula. It's like just over 100 pages, written super easy. Uh, it has like a lot of really great strategies for how to uh, create a routine. I know you've read it. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, great book. It's a great book for sure. Um, it, I think it's like $4 on audio, audio $4.99 or something like that. Definitely uh, easy and quick read. I think that is all I have for today. Where can uh, people find you, Michael? <laughs> uh, I am at Michael Cajou, C-A-Z-A-Y-O-U-X on Instagram. I don't use the Twitter very much. And then obviously you can find the team at Brute.Strength. And sign up for the newsletter at? BruteStrengthTraining.com. Um, thanks to everybody who signed up for the Brute Body Program. We're excited to get started with you guys. How about you? What about me? Where can they find you? <laughs> you can find me at Adi Zucker uh, on Instagram, A D E E Z U K I E R. You can find me. <laughs> and you can find my team at Working Against Gravity, as well as sign up for our newsletter at www.workingagainstgravity.com. Word. Thanks Thank for you. letting me interview you.